Open your Bibles and turn to Psalm 115. Today we are going to be looking at Psalm 115. And uh, to begin with, I want you to think about this. Um, Any mechanic worth his salt will tell you that your vehicle needs uh, a regular tune-up. And so every so often, you need to bring it in and check the fluids, the filters, uh, the the brakes, and and really many other parts. All of that needs to be checked and maintained. And if you don't, you know what happens. You know that eventually your vehicle will start to uh, run poorly and uh, it won't function like it was supposed to. And eventually it'll simply break down and you won't be able to use it. And so a regular tune-up, regular checkups are important to maintain your vehicle. And this is true for so many areas of our lives, right? Uh, We have also other pieces of equipment that we regularly need to uh, maintain and check and see how they're doing. Uh, Even our own bodies, we need to go to the doctor and get a physical and get checked out. Uh, just to keep things going and make sure everything's working well. Uh, we understand that for so many areas of our lives. And, uh, and yet I think sometimes we forget that our soul, our, 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 our spiritual life needs also a tune-up from time to time as well. It's necessary, as it were, to pull the car over and uh, to see the state of our soul and to ask ourselves, how are we doing spiritually? Am I, am I devoted wholeheartedly in following the Lord in, in all areas of my life? Can I, can I see growth and holiness? Am I growing in, in love and worship to God? Or, or am, am I just serving Him? Am I just busy for Him? What, what sins in my life do I need to, to give my attention to and to mortify? Am, am I running the race well in this life? And this is a really good exercise of the soul, which can be done any day of the year. There's no set time that should should be done. But I think especially it's appropriate when we begin a new year. If you haven't noticed, today is the last day of 2023. And uh, as we end the old year and begin a new year, it is very helpful for us to look back and to, to think about how things went in this year, evaluate our progress, but then also to consider the year ahead. And and to aid us in doing a bit of a tune-up of the soul, I want to look at Psalm 115 today. And uh, before we get into the text, I would like to read it. So if you have your Bibles open, we're going to read through Psalm 115. I'm going to be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Uh, is not much different than the, than, the, the, than the New American Standard, but that's what I'll, read, I'll be using today. So there it begins by this. Not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. As for their hands, they do not feel. As for their feet, they do not walk. They do not make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh, for he is their help and their shield. Yahweh remembers us, remembered us. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Yahweh. The small together with the great. May Yahweh give You increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh, and the earth, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. It is not the dead that praise Yah. It is none of those who go down to silence. But as for us, we will bless Yah, both now and till forever. Praise Yah. This psalm... 
really, as we look at its application, as we, as we understand that, what the, the point of uh, each section is, it provides us with really four questions, four questions that we're going to use today to help us to do a spiritual tune-up, to evaluate our own hearts, to, to see where our lives should go in the new year. And the four questions for each section are this. In verse one, we're going to see, are you living for God's glory? And in verses two to eight, we're going to see, are you putting to death idolatry in your heart? And in verses nine to 15, we're going to see the question is, are you depending on the Lord? And then verse 16 to 18, we're going to ask the question, are you committed to praising God's name? So there's four questions we're going to consider today to help us evaluate our, our spiritual lives. The first question there is, are you living for the glory of God? And you can see this in verse one. And verse one says, not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Verse one here provides Israel's motivation for asking God to act on their behalf to hear their prayers. They, they begin by, by declaring that they are really unworthy of all credit, all honor, all, all praise. They're not worthy for God to act on their behalf simply because of who they are. You'll notice the, the negative repetition there. Not to us, not to us. There's almost a, an abhorrence of the idea that they would receive any any credit, that God would do this because there's something worthy in them. This, this repetition um, highlights really their, their, their humility, their eager, humble desire that God himself, God alone would receive all the glory for what they ask him to do. And, and, and this, by this request that, that they would not receive the glory, they're, they're really confessing their own sinfulness. They're really confessing their own guilt. Israel, as they sing this psalm, knew that they didn't deserve anything. They, have been, they were unfaithful to the Lord. They had sinned in many times. They were a weak and erring people. They deserve nothing but judgment. And so they don't ask God to, to save them, to help them be based on, well, we've done some good things in our life, and we had a pretty good year, and you know what? Uh, we were offered a lot of sacrifices this year. They, they know they deserve nothing. And they really have a correct attitude as they come before God with their requests and petitions. On the, on the flip side of that, there's a positive, right? They want God to act for the, for, the, for the glory of his own name. Not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory. Your name refers to as we've said many times, to God's character. The name represents all that God is. It, and it's to God's name, God's person, that they want all credit, all praise, all honor and glory to him. They're really asking God to honor and glorify himself by, by helping his people, by acting on behalf of his people. And why, why should God receive the glory? Well, you see that at the end there, verse one, because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Here, loving kindness is the word hesed, the, the word that's often uh, um, used in the Psalms, the, uh, a word that refers to God's steadfast love for his people, his covenant love, his faithfulness. And then in, this, in a very similar word there, because of your truth, which also could be translated faithfulness. And it's really these two attributes that would be uniquely displayed um, as God would act on Israel's behalf to vindicate her and to deliver Israel from her enemies. And so the psalmist and the congregation do not ask God to act on their behalf because they, they, do, they think there's something worthy in themselves, but their desires that God would act on their behalf for his own name to vindicate his own holy name, to show himself great among the nations. And so they have a passion for God's glory. They, they have a desire that, that God alone would be glorified in what he should do. And this passion, this desire for God's glory in our lives should be our passion as well. And 
we ought to also realize that we don't deserve any glory. We don't deserve any credit, any praise for anything. I mean, if you just look back over the last year, um, 2023, um, you know, think about all the times that you have sinned. How many times do you think you've sinned over the past year? Maybe three or four times a day? Probably not, hey? It's probably a lot more than that. There's probably too many times to an even number and to count that, that you have sinned. Uh, I composed this little ditty here. It says, count your sins, name them one by one, and it will surprise you how much evil you have done. Um, not a really popular song, uh, but, <laughs> but it's true. Once you, once you look back and you consider how much you have failed, uh, you realize how much you owe to God's grace. And even if you look back on the last year and you can see areas where you've grown as a Christian, there's there's ministry opportunities that you've had uh, a chance to serve God and serve the body with, Um, even as you look at all the the good things that you can see over the year, you can't take any credit for that either. Can you boast in your good works in your ministry here? No, you can't. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That verse teaches us unless that that all the good that we do, any spiritual fruit that we see, any progress we saw over the last year, all of that is, is, we can't trace to ourselves. That's the work of Christ in our lives. And for him, All of that, then the glory goes to him. And even as we think about all the gifts we have, the abilities, the resources, the opportunities that all of us have each each day, those do not come from ourselves as well. All of that comes, is given to us by the God who created us, the God who put us in the place and station that we find ourselves in. And so if we take stock of all of that, we really should come to the awareness a correct awareness of our own selves that, realize, that we realize deeply from that, that we can't take any credit, that we, can't, we don't deserve any glory, and that we should be eager, eager to see that all the glory goes to God, who alone deserves it. And so as you go into the new year, you can ask yourself this question, am I committed to pursuing the glory of God in my life? Is it my desire that God will receive all the glory, the praise, and honor? And that's, that's very easy to say, isn't it? And all of us here might go, yeah, 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 I like that. I mean, I'm, I'm good with that. I, I'm all about the glory of God. And yet, I wonder, and I just have a couple questions here to, to dig a little bit deeper. How, how committed are we to God's glory? Are you willing to accept sufferings and trials so that God will be glorified in your life? And when you're confronted with sin, are you still willing to live for the glory of God by repenting and putting to death that sin? Are you even willing to joyfully serve here uh, or elsewhere without receiving any recognition or appreciation from other people, but simply because you want God to be glorified in your life and you will, you will um, accept the, the, the praise that he will give you one day. Thomas Watson said this, and I think it's very helpful. It's a good prayer that we should all pray. He says this, Lord, I'm content to be a loser if it would cause you to be a gainer. I am content to have less health if by it I would receive more of your grace and you be more glorified. Lord, I desire your glory above all things in my life. And really that desire there is is echoed in in the Apostle Paul as well, where he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so the psalmist and the congregation that's singing with him are appealing uh, to God to answer their prayers for his own glory and honor. But but really, what's going on here? What's what's the trouble that brings this petition out in in Israel? And really, that's our our second section, answers that that question. And um, 
We'll see that in a moment. But in the verses two to eight, we have the question that we're going to ask ourselves of, are you putting to death idolatry in your heart? And as we, we, as we look at this section, we're going to see that the prominence and of, uh, of idolatry here in this section. Uh, in verse two, we do find the question, uh, the mocking question of the pagan world. This is Verse two really is, gives us a clue of what's going on uh, in the background of this psalm. Because it says there in verse two, why should the nation say, where now is their God? And, and so here you have the nations around Israel, they're, they're mocking Israel, they're, they're taunting Israel as, as where is your God? Where is, where is, where is your God? Where, why is he not there to help you? And we can, we can um, assume that, that Israel's in some trouble. Israel's um, at a low point, and their low point in trouble seems to indicate to the nations that, that Yahweh, their God, isn't really helping them. And in those days, if you know, each nation had, had their, own, their own God. And if uh, a nation was defeated in battle, it, it signified that their God was also defeated and that the nation that defeated them had a stronger God. And so uh, in the pagan mind at that time, if Israel was doing badly as a nation, it was a, it was a reflection of God, of their God, that he was not able to help them. And so there's this mocking question of the pagan world, where now is their God? And this question isn't just, uh, isn't really a question that's questioning um, Israel's or Yahweh's existence, or, or mocking Israel for having no visible representation of their God, like the pagans did. The pagans had, of course, idols, and in Israel's temple, there was no representation of God. This, this isn't a question about whether God doesn't exist, you can't see him. The nations are taunting Israel because they're, they see their God as being powerless, as being weak, as someone who doesn't care about his people and the troubles that they're going through indicate to them that Yahweh simply doesn't care about them. Yahweh is not interested in their lives. Yahweh can't do anything for them. He is weak. He's powerless. He's been defeated. And so while the nations are mocking Israel, they're really at the same time because the nation and, it, and, and God have, are, are really together here. They're really insulting God. And so how does the psalmist respond to this scoffing question? He does so in two ways. And the first, there's a positive and there's a negative response. Notice what he says there in verse two or verse three here to this question. But our God is in the heavens and does whatever he pleases. The nations have asked, where is God? Where is your God? And the psalmist responds, our God is in the heavens. Our God is not on this earth like all your other petty gods. He's in the heavens. He's above everything. He's ruling over all of this world. He's above all else. He sits on his throne in heavens and rules over the entire universe. That's where our God is. He's maybe not here like your idols are, but he is ruling over all things. And notice this emphasis on the absolute sovereignty of God. This is such a great verse here. But our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. God does whatever God wants to do. And, and there's nothing that can hinder the will of God in this sense. There's no, there's not a, God doesn't have a lack of wisdom or power or knowledge that would limit his sovereignty. All of Satan and all of his hosts can't, can't keep God from carrying out his purposes. All the schemes of evil men can't hinder God's plans. God does everything he pleases and nothing is going to hinder him. Nothing will thwart him in, in what he will do. Men on earth think he's weak and powerless, but the psalmist knows that God is almighty in his power and his will reigns supreme over the whole earth. And that's the first, the, the first way he responds, by positive, by, by reminding Israel of, of the absolute supremacy and sovereignty of God. But in verses 4 to 8, the psalmist responds in a negative way. And he goes on the offensive. And, and the world has taunted Yahweh. But now the psalmist engages in some 
sanctifying taunting of the idols of the nations. And as he does that, we see some very important truths about idolatry that come out in this, this, this section that are very instructive for us. The psalmist teaches God's people that, that idolatry is, is deranged, it's deceptive, it's disappointing, and it's destructive. First, you see how in this section, how idolatry is, is really deranged. It's, it's madness. It's crazy. Uh, verse 4 Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. And the psalmist reminds Israel, idols are really just created things. They they may be made with valuable metals like gold and silver, but actually they're worthless because they're actually the creation of created beings. Idols are actually less than people because people are created in the image of God. Idols are actually less than animals because at least animals are living creatures. Idols are actually less than plants, uh, because plants can actually grow and reproduce. Idols are actually less than even the dead, because at least at one time the dead were alive, and idols have never been alive. And so you can see, just that, as you think about that, how insane it is to trust and worship an idol. The creators of the idols are actually more worthy of trust than the idols that the, um, themselves. And so the psalmist reminds uh, Israel that idolatry, the idolatry is really crazy, it's deranged, but idols, idolatry is also deceptive. There's something about idolatry that, that deceives men into thinking that these lifeless creations can actually help. It seems that they can help. And you can see that in the section here where it says they have mouths, they have eyes, they have ears, they have noses, um, they have hands, and they have feet. They have all of those things. And they have all the appearance of being able to hear, to see, to move, to act, to to, to maybe to answer prayers, to speak, to to act and deliver. But but really, it's just a facade. They're, They're really simply powerless. And there's something about idols and idolatry that deceive us into thinking that they can actually provide what what we want. And that's why people, one of the reasons why people turn to idolatry. Third thing is that idolatry is disappointing. As we've said, idols have the same features, at least outwardly, of people. Uh, But they do not function. You'll look at uh, that section again and look at all the do nots. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They do not see. They they do not hear. They do not smell. They they do not feel. They do not walk. They do not make a sound with their throats. Idols are blind. They're deaf. They're mute. They're paralyzed. They're helpless. They're powerless. They're lifeless. This is the tragic reality of idolatry. It seems like these idols idols can help and and people turn to them for help to try to meet their needs, and yet they always come away empty-handed. They always fail to deliver what what they promise. And yet man in his foolishness and his blindness, spiritual blindness, continues to go to them over and over again, thinking maybe he can get a different result by doing the same thing. But it never happens. Idols are simply powerless to truly help us. And then in verse 8, we see that idolatry is destructive. Notice what it says there in verse 8. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. Isn't that an interesting statement? How, how do idol worshipers and idol makers become like the idols they worship? Isn't that a curious statement? It's an interesting thought. Well, if you look back at the condition, the psalmist has just described the condition of idols. And if you look back, you'll, you'll see how the idols really look alive, but really they're, they're dead, useless, lifeless, and helpless. There's a blindness, a deafness that, that the idols have. And so this is the state of, I- of these idols. And now he says, those who make them will become like them. And really, this is what happened eventually the worshipers of idols begin to reflect, to look like the very idols they worship. 
They take on those characteristics. They reflect their idol in their thinking and their actions. J.K. Beale has a book that deals with this whole subject. And he says this. This is the premise of his book. People resemble what they revere or what they worship either for ruin or restoration. People resemble what they revere or what they worship either for ruin or for restoration. And when people engage in idolatry, they eventually, it, I, the idolatry itself brings about a spiritual dullness. It desensitizes our spiritual senses. It turns us into those idols where we're blind spiritually. We're, we're deaf to the truth. We cannot feel like we should feel. We, we begin to be just even more and more spiritually dead and calloused. There's a growing loss of our spiritual senses that leads to the, really produces a, blind, a blindness to the harm and to the hurt that the idol is causing in our lives. And so idolatry is dangerous. It's destructive. Uh, this even just comes out in Romans, uh, the first chapter there. Romans 24 and 25, it says this, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation or cr creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so Romans 1 also reminds us that as we reject the true and living God and go off into worship idols, we, God gives us over to a, a spiritual blindness and dullness and to our own sin. You know, most people in our culture don't have a statue of an idol that they worship. Some cultures still do. But all people are obviously worship, idol worshipers um, from the heart. It really, the, the idolatrous desire that, that causes a person to craft an idol is still there in our hearts. And really, an idol can be simply anything we love, value, trust, or serve more than God. It can even be good things that begin to dominate our lives, that, that, that rule our lives more than God and his word. So our culture still is an idolatrous culture. They worship all sorts of things. And as a Christian, if you've, you have turned away from idols to worship the living God, idolatry's power has been broken in your life. And yet, even for the Christian, we still struggle to remove idols in our own hearts. Really, every time we sin, it's because there's some idolatry in the heart. And even Christian, as they, Christians, as they, they, as they pursue idolatry, as they, as they, they maybe become uh, uh, under the control of some kind of idol, they can get, be dominated by that. And when that happens, even Christians can in some way start to reflect the idol that they are worshiping. Our, our idolatry dulls our spiritual senses and weakens our spiritual health. And we can struggle with so many different idols. Uh, it can be things like family and marriage, ministry, cars, money, sensual pleasure, sports, respect, and, and even really the one idol that rules them all is that of the pr prideful self. And so as you begin this new year, I want you to ask yourself and to think about your life, what are some idols in my life that need to be destroyed? What are some things that are ruling me, that are controlling me more than God? Where, where, is, where in your heart is there some idolatrous desires that need to be repented of and replaced by the worship of God and obedience to his word? So in the year to come, commit yourself to the destruction of, of the idols that you see in your own heart. So in this section that we've been looking at, the psalmist has really been showing Israel the foolishness of the mocking question of the pagans. He's, he's shown us how God is, is in heaven, sovereignly ruling all, all things, unlike the, the fake, uh, the powerless idols that the nations worship. He ends with this warning that those who trust in idols will become like their idols. And then in verses 9 to 11, there's an an exhortation for Israel to trust in the Lord. 
And in this section, we're going to look at the question of, are you depending on the Lord? This whole section is, is the last section ends with don't trust idols. But in this section, it says, but trust your God. You'll see there in verses um, 9 to 11 there, O Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You'll notice the dominant command here is trust. To trust means to to be confident in, to rely upon someone or something. It's a a word that has uh, associated with the idea of firmness, uh, sturdiness. Uh, The idea here is a firm reliance. And the firm reliance is to be on on God, on Israel's God, Yahweh. And that command to trust, the exhortation to trust, is given to three groups, if you'll notice there. Uh, First group is Israel. The whole nation as a whole is called to trust in Yahweh. Uh, The house of Aaron, that the priests who ministered in the temple, they're called to trust in Yahweh. And then the psalmist broadens it out to everyone who fears the Lord, All who fear the Lord are called to to trust in Yahweh. And and then they're given the reason why they're to do that. Notice what it says there. It says it three times again. He is their help and their shield. Here the psalmist acknowledges that Yahweh, their God, actually provides real help, real deliverance for his people. He is a real help, an ever-present help for his people. Unlike the idols who are powerless to do anything, Yahweh can. Yahweh can help his people. Yahweh can provide what they need. He can deliver. He can help them. And then he also mentions that he is their shield. Obviously, you understand what a shield is. What a shield is for, it's for protection. And soldiers would hide behind their shield as they would go into battle. And in the same way, Yahweh, our God, is a shield to us. He's a shield to Israel. He's he's protection When we hide ourselves in Yahweh, when we trust our God, he protects us. He cares for us. He he provides us with an almighty, absolute protection that's complete. As we go into the next section, we, we, we know that those who trust in the Lord will never be disappointed. Whenever you turn to idolatry, whenever you turn to your favorite idol, they will always disappoint you. They promise all sorts of stuff, but never can actually deliver. But here we learn that Yahweh, our God, is a God who never disappoints us. When we trust in him, he will provide what we need. He will protect us as he sees fit. And you can see that in in the next section where in verses 12 to 15, it's the blessing of of our God that, that dominates this section. Verse 12, it says, Yahweh remembered us. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Yahweh, the small together with the great. And in verse 12, the psalmist um, is, is thinking about how God responds to Israel's trust. There seems, as, as we said, Israel's in a difficult position. They're, they're not feeling like under the the favor of God, and yet the psalmist continues to call Israel to trust God because he won't disappoint them. And in the end, we see the answer to their prayers, and that's in this this section here where God, Yahweh remembers them. And and to remember them doesn't mean that, that God somehow forgot about his people and he was doing some things over here and some things over there. And then, you know, he remembered, oh yeah, like I, I have this people this nation that, that needs my help, I should go check and see how they're doing today. Uh, that's not at all what it means that God, Yahweh or God remembers us. When God remembers, he's simply acting based on his promises. God had promised to hear the prayers of those who trust him. And when God answers those prayers, God is said to have remembered his people. Or God has promised to be faithful to his people. And, and when he is faithful to them, He he is said to remember his people. And that's what it means in this context, that God has 
answered their prayers, that God has been faithful to his people. And that the result of that God remembering is that God blesses his people. His blessing comes upon Israel. And then you can see in verses 12 and 13, the same three groups that we saw in the, the next, last section there are mentioned again, the house of Israel, the house of Aaron, and those who fear Yahweh. All of those who are called to trust in Yahweh now are said to be, have been blessed by Yahweh. You can see just that uh, this blessing has no partiality. The small together with the great are blessed. And uh, verses 14 to 15 really are this a sort of a benediction. One of the interesting features of this psalm is it seems that different groups would sing different parts of this song. And uh, we don't know exactly what that would look like, but there seems to be this one group singing this, one group saying that, and they're answering and talking back and forth in this psalm. And so in verses 14 and 15, we see some other chorus or other group joining in where it says, may Yahweh give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of Yahweh who made heaven and earth. Notice what it says there. There's a benediction there of, of asking God to give his people increase. What does it mean that God would give his people increase? Well, I think if we look at that word and what it refers to in other places, we can come to the reasonable conclusion, conclusion that this is an increase in, in, in prosperity, an increase in, 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 uh, in population, that God is pouring out his blessings on his people. He's restoring his people to a place of, of, of prominence. And you'll notice that it also says it, it's added uh, to you, you and your children. May Yahweh give you increase, you and your children. And so there's an element of the future here as well. It's not just the present where they're praying that God would bless his people, bless them and, and increase them and make them prosperous. It's, it's even looking towards the future to their children. May they also enjoy that blessing as well. And so it seems that Israel was going through this rough time as a nation, as she often frequently did, but God was faithful to his people. And when they turned to him in repentance, he heard their prayers and, and blessed them. He restored them. And that seems to be what's occurred in our psalm here. And while there was this small taste of that blessing from God at the time that the psalm was written, really this benediction will be completely fulfilled in the future where God increases his people, where God blesses his people, Israel, as they enter the new covenant in Christ as a nation. Verse 15 is a really great verse because it gives us, uh, it reminds us, it teaches us of, of that God has the ability and the power to bless his people. Notice what it says in verse 15, may you be blessed of Yahweh who made heaven and earth. This truth reminds God's people that he does have the, the power and the wisdom to bless them. He's the God who made everything. The God who made everything. That he, you can see all the heavens above, all the stars, the planets, the universe, all of that. He made that simply by speaking. God created everything in this world. He made every individual. He made all the creatures, the animals. He made all the plants. Everything God made simply by speaking. He called things that were not into existence. And if God is the God who did that, God can certainly answer our prayers. God can certainly bless us. God can certainly do what, what he's promised to do. There's no reason for us to doubt God. God is fully able to do what he's promised. God will have no trouble to, in, in doing the things he's promised to us. And so there's no reason why we should doubt. But we have every reason to trust in God that he can act on our behalf. And so as we consider, end this section here, and as we think about really the dominant theme of trusting in the Lord, depending on him, relying on him, as you, as you think about the new year ahead, will you trust in the Lord? Will you grow in your trust in him? Really, that's easy to say, right? Hey, you just got to trust in the Lord. Those are often just empty platitudes, nice things that people say. We, we want something more than that. What does it mean that we, are called, well, that we should trust in the Lord? How, how are we going to trust in the Lord in the new year? Well, it's, it's trusting that, that God's wise. 
when we're confused and life seems out of control. It's trusting that God is good when trials come into our lives. It's when we're afraid, we, we're, we trust that God is sovereign. He's with us, that he cares for us. Trusting the Lord means, means taking all your struggles, your concerns, and your needs to God in prayer. It's living in dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit as you, as you put off sin, as you fight against sin, as you mortify sin, as you put away idolatry from your life. It's really trusting that, that God in his ways are, bring greater joy than, than the passing pleasures of sin. And, and then choosing to obey God rather than our temptations. You see, trusting God is not just something, some vague kind of concept out there. It's something very practical. It's something you do every day. Every morning you wake up, you can pray, God, I need you to, to help me today to, re to represent you well, to reflect your glory to the watching world and to do what you've called me to do. Help me, God. That's, that's trusting God each day. And that's what we're called to do from this psalm. Are you trusting God? Will you trust him in the year to come? How are you doing with that? Because God is our help and our shield, and we can trust him. And now we come to the last section of this psalm. And the question we have for this section is, are you committed to praising God's name? So the psalm began with the, the psalmists and the congregation really asking, or really uh, declaring that glory should be given only to God. And the psalm ends by God's people declaring that they are going to give God glory by praising him and serving him. And in verse 16, the psalmist reminds God's people of their task to steward the earth for God. It says there, the heavens are the heavens of Yahweh, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. In verse 15, as we read it before, we, we just under, we, we saw there that God has created the heavens and the earth. All the universe is his. But in verse 16, it adds that, that the, the heavens or, or the space and planets, the, the stars, that's given to God to rule over exclusively. But the earth is given to man to rule on God's behalf. behalf. We were made to rule over God's world. We were made to be good stewards for God and for his glory on this earth. And that stewardship requires us and gives us the responsibility of praising and worshiping our king creator while we, we live on this earth. While we live on this planet, we are called to worship and serve God. And when death comes, there's no more opportunities on this earth to praise or serve God in this world. Notice verse 17. It is not the dead that praise Yah, it is none of those who go down to silence. The psalmist here is not denying the resurrection. I think it's clear he understands that there is a resurrection. You can see that, in, especially in the next verse, verse 18. But what he is saying here is when we die, we leave this world, and our, really our time to praise God among the nations is gone. If you've ever been to a graveyard, they're very silent places, right? There's, there's nothing, no praises coming out of the tombs or the graves. There's, there's no praises to God being heard there. And that's what happens when we die. We, we, we leave the choir here and join the choir up in heaven. But here, our voice is then silent. And so in verse 18, the psalmist says this with the, other, with the congregation, but as for us, we will bless Yah. So he is saying then that... Um, you know, yes, uh, when we die, we are, we are not going to be able to praise the Lord. So now we are going to bless Yah. And the word bless there has the same idea of praise. Um, it's speaking, the idea of speaking well of God, praising God, enriching his reputation by our words, by our, our, our praises. And so the congregation says that they're going to bless or praise God from now until forever. Here is again, here's a hint of the resurrection. Here is a set that the psalmist and the congregation understood that their praises don't just end when they die. Yes, they end when they die. Their praises end on earth, but they will forever be praising the Lord. Their praises will continue in heaven. 
And so the psalm then ends with an invitation really for all people to praise the Lord. And you notice what it says there, just two words, praise Yah. The word Yah there is just simply a shortened form of Yahweh. And this is, uh, it ends the psalm where, uh, with it really an invitation for all people. All people are called to praise Yahweh, praise him. It's not enough for the psalmist and the congregation to, to praise his God and his, their, their God and Savior alone in some kind of monastery. They want all people to join with them in praising God on this earth. He wants all peoples to be worshiping the one and true God who is alone worthy of honor and praise, glory and majesty. See, he understands that their time to promote God's glory on earth is short. It's limited. It's only here. And he then calls all of us to lift up our voices, to use our words to promote God's glory, to, 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 to praise him. Especially here, the idea of wanting to see all people also worship God, wanting to see all people to know this God, to love this God, to serve this God. We, want, we should want all people to, to leave idolatry, to leave those foolish things behind and to, to trust and to love the one true God, to, to come to the gospel in Jesus Christ and find salvation and, and forgiveness. And so really there's even a, a hint here of, of, of wanting the nations to come and, and join them in worship. And is, is that what you're doing with your life? The psalmist understood that there's a brevity to this life, that life is short. As, as each year passes, and New Year's is a great time for that, we're reminded of, of how short life is, how quickly the years go by. We're always moving closer and closer to the day of our death. Maybe, maybe 2024 will be written on your tombstone. Maybe this is your last year on earth. Maybe you have no more opportunities after this year to serve and praise God. Every passing year reminds us just how short life is. Our time to serve God, our time to glorify God, our time to tell people of the gospel, tell people of how good God is, is, is limited. And when, you're, when you die, your voice is silenced. You don't have that opportunity anymore. And so as we go through, as we go to another year, we're reminded of the brevity of life. You live as one who lives with eternity in his view, who sees the day of his death soon ahead and uses your voice to, to proclaim the glories of your King and your Savior, Jesus Christ. So hopefully this psalm was helpful as a tune-up for your soul. Hopefully it helps you to look at your own spiritual life and to consider where you are. How are you running this race? What, what areas of your life has this psalm revealed that needs some work? Where, what will you do to correct the problems that you see? Where, correct where you've gone off course by the power of, and, and, and depend upon the Lord, depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit to, to put yourself in the right direction by God's help. And for some of you, well, maybe this psalm showed you that you're, you're really broken down and going in the wrong direction. You don't just need a tune-up. You need a new heart. You need a new life. You realize you're not living for the glory of God. You're just living for yourself. You're, you, and you realize maybe that you have all sorts of idols, that you're not depending on the Lord, and you, you have no interest in praising and worshiping God. Maybe that's you. Well, you also need to re realize from this psalm uh, that you stand condemned before God. God will hold every person accountable for all that they do on the day of judgment. And you will be found guilty in that day. You will be condemned and thrown in forever into the lake of fire. But the good news that I bring today is that you can be forgiven. You can, you can be pardoned. So I would encourage you, if, I would urge you, I would exhort you, if, if this is you, that you come to Jesus Christ who is the Savior of sinners. You would come to Christ to find forgiveness. 
that you would come to the Savior who died on behalf of sinners, who suffered the punishment for their sins on the cross and lived a perfect life so that they could be declared righteous, that you would come to him and receive the gift that he offers freely. Receive this gift by faith and repent of your sins. And if you do this, you can begin the new year with a new heart, with a new life, with a new hope, which will all be given to you in Christ Jesus. So if you've never done that today, then I would urge you and encourage you to do that today. Well, let's pray. Well, Father, and thank you for this psalm. Thank you for um, that you are such a great God. Thank you that we are able to worship you. Lord, how good you are how kind you are, how, how often you have not been our help and our strength, how you've proved yourself over and over to us. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We're so grateful that we can know you through Jesus Christ, that we can be reconciled to you. We, we're grateful, Lord, and we pray that our lives would be given to you, that your glory and honor would be our uh, passion in life, Lord. And so, Father, we, we pray that you would uh, bless um, the remainder of this service, bless our singing, and bless your, the, the, the celebration of the Lord's Supper as well, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.